All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, welcome back to this, uh, the second part of um, this workshop. Um, my name is Harold Benning. I'm a professor of banking and finance at the School of Economics and Management at Tilburg University. Um, the second part of this workshop is about taking slightly a more macroeconomic perspective. It's on energy justice, European values, and the European Green Deal. And we are very privileged um, and honored uh, for this afternoon to have uh, Dr. Guntram Wolf having as our keynote speaker. Um, I'm sure most of you know his name. He was between 2013 and 2022. He was the director of the Bruegel Institute uh, in uh, Brussels. Um, it developed under his leadership into one of the leading uh, European and global think tanks. And now, uh, Guntram, uh, you're back in Germany. You are now the, the CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations. And of course, that is also a very important uh, position. We all know that uh, the, uh, the, the positioning of Germany and the Netherlands in the European Union is very key in many areas. So let me give you the floor um, uh, for your presentation and thank you very much again for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Harald, uh, Benning, for hosting me today. It's a real pleasure to be uh, with you and to give this presentation. So I only see uh, basically the curtain behind, behind Harald, but I assume that you can hear me loud and clearly. And if ever there's some, oh, wonderful, the camera is turned. So I can actually see my audience. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so so um, thanks so much for being, being with me. So look, I got this title, which is of course uh, a very, very big and wide title. And so, so what I thought I would do um, is is really look into the energy price, uh, the energy shock of 22, um, describe how this shock has affected the European Union and Germany and Central and Eastern Europe in particular, and what have been the kind of adjustments um, that the energy shock has triggered, and how in the end this um, is accelerating or is supposed to accelerate the Green Deal. Um, and look, then the financing comes in, you know, how do we get this funded and especially the public investment bit, how do we get it, get it funded? So, so this is already a very vast, uh, um, no, I don't cover all the titles, uh, all the sort of topics on the title, but I think a fair bit of, you know, what, what is actually happening, um, what has happened in 22 and what are the big challenges um, of the green transition going, going forward. Um, but let me start really by um, uh, showing you a bit about um, the energy shock. And perhaps um, I start with this chart. Um, this chart um, gives you the price of um, gas um, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And you see this extraordinary um, price hike um, in the course of last year, uh, showing that um, you know, there was really something big going on in the um, European energy uh, and gas markets in particular. Now, what was this? Well, uh, of course, last year uh, was marked by a major foreign policy event, namely uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which um, triggered um, uh, uh, a lot of uncertainty, but triggered also a very vivid debate um, in um, Europe, um, in the world, about how to sanction Russia um, and, you know, what would happen if Russia sanctioned us. So there were two debates simultaneously. Um, the one, uh, the first one was about, you know, how can we make sure that Russia makes less profits on the sale of oil and gas um, to Europe. Um, and it was in particular to Europe uh, because the pipeline infrastructure is very much oriented towards Europe. Um, alternatives for gas in particular are very difficult for Russia to um, activate uh, and were very difficult for Russia to activate in the short term. So, so essentially the question was, would Russia continue to deliver uh, gas to Europe, would we uh, stop importing or would Russia stop exporting uh, gas? And it turned out that this uncertainty was a major driver 
um, of um, a global energy price uh, shock. Um, why was it such a major driver? Well, basically because Russia um, is the biggest uh, exporter of gas in the world, I mean, prior to this war, and the second biggest exporter of oil and so uh, in the world, yeah? And so, so there was all of a sudden this huge uncertainty about the supply um, of the, the biggest exporter of fossil fuels. Uh, to the world economy, um, would they uh, be allowed to still export um, or not, or would they by themselves stop exporting uh, to Europe uh, to put pressure on Germany in particular? Um, Central and Eastern European countries uh, were particularly dependent on natural gas imports from Russia, Germany, more than 50%, Hungary and Slovakia, more than 80%. The EU as a whole, um, uh, it got 45% of its gas from, from Russia. And a major part of the response um, has been um, demand reduction and increased reliance on liquefied natural gas, LNG, that you get by ships and gas from Norway. Um, and so, so just to give you a sense of um, uh, uh, sort of the, the geography of this, I mean, this is from uh, my old institute, Brügel, um, where we, we and, and the Spiegel has sort of graphically done this very nicely, where we show, you know, the red part here is um, the amount of uh, gas coming from Russia, while the blue is the rest uh, is, is other imports. And that's prior to the prior to the war. And what you see here is, and the bigger the box, the more gas it is, right? So, so what you see here, all of Eastern Europe, including Germany, but also to some extent Italy were extremely dependent on Russian gas. And so there was a real fear um, that by stopping these gas import, uh, exports, Russia could uh, inflict major economic damage on this part of the world. Um, and uh, conversely, we were quite afraid of sanctioning uh, Russia uh, because of the possible economic repercussions. Now, this debate, um, led to major adjustments. And one major adjustment has been um, the increased reliance on LNG, meaning uh, gas flows uh, would, um, uh, would, have been, would have been organized differently so that they could come from the West to the East instead from the East to the West. There was also major demand reductions in, uh, in, in gas demand uh, because the price signal uh, continued to operate, meaning, um, uh, the policy response was done in a way that uh, gas prices continued to be high. There were subsidies given to buffer a bit the effects, but the, the price signal remained in the major countries, in particular in Germany. And that led to major demand reductions, uh, meaning energy intensive industries, the most energy intensive parts of the industry uh, were moved um, were moved abroad, while the key, the, the main value chains actually remained. Um, and uh, households also significantly reduce their consumption by basically putting on more sweaters and you know uh, having colder temperatures in the winter in, in the house. And of course, we were quite lucky because um, the um, winter was relatively uh, relatively mild. I mean, just to to graphically illustrate, you know, what a big sea change this was. Um, uh, this is. Um, prior to the war, um, how gas uh, was supplied to the region. So you see it's really coming uh, from the east and, and from, uh, from Norway. So, so major um, uh, supply was really, the major supplier was really um, the, uh, the east of, the east was really Russia. And, you know, um, uh, then it really uh, changes very dramatically. And, you know, we are, you can see how in the course of the, the crisis, um, you know, there were new interconnectors built. Uh, you see here interconnectors to allow flow from west to the east. There were LNG terminals, major LNG terminals built in, in Germany. Um, the LNG imports uh, through the Netherlands and through um, Belgium increased. Uh, they also increased to Italy and the, the South pipeline through uh, Turkey was really increased and to, to, through the Black Sea as well. So, so these are really very big adjustments that happened in a very short period of time on the supply side. Thanks to all these measures, so demand savings, um, additional supplies and more certainty, 
um, eventually the situation in the global gas markets um, and the global energy markets stabilized and gas prices are now uh, down. Um, they basically, the gas price hike uh, came down after the summer or in the summer when it became clear that the sanctioning of oil and gas would be done in a very moderate way. Um, in fact, the only sanction as of now, basically as of January, we've been sanctioning oil, um, while gas um, is, has been sanctioned essentially by Russia itself. So Russia had stopped exporting gas to Europe um, back in uh, back in the fall of last year. So so this is uh, this is the situation on the energy market. But but the shock. The shock is really is, has been really a big a big shock, and so so the question is, what does what does this shock mean for our climate policy? And you know the the basic point that I really want you to take away is that um, this energy shock um, incentivized um, uh, energy savings, um, and some of these savings, um, for example, those that are achieved through better insulation will actually be permanent um, savings. Um, so that, that's actually good climate policy, right? So, so higher energy prices leading to uh, a reduction in emissions. Um, some emissions, uh, however, were just sort of shifted or even increased uh, because of fuel switching, in particular to coal. Um, coal is a much more dirty uh, way of producing um, en electricity than, than um, uh, burning, burning of gas. And, um, you know, that, that, that part was bad for climate last year, but it's essentially going to be reversed as gas prices have come down. So, so there the, the long-term effect is quite neutral. Now, there's a big debate on nuclear, and I'm sure you've, you've seen that, but um, I don't want to enter too much into detail now, but basically Germany has ended its nuclear era actually yesterday. Um, and um, uh, of course, there is now this huge debate within the European Union, uh, you know, how green nuclear really is. Um, is it really climate neutral? How clean climate neutral is it? What are the risks associated and so on? Uh, but it is clear that on nuclear policy, um, energy, uh, nuclear energy policy, there's huge differences across different European countries with France, but also Poland, uh, really um, emphasizing the benefits of nuclear energy, uh, while Germany being, being very skeptical. Now, the, the third point really is that the price signal um, also incentivized um, the buildup of renewable energy. And in 22, um, the installation of photovoltaic systems actually increased substantially in the European Union, it increased by 47% compared to the previous year. Um, and uh, so basically everybody I knew uh, was sort of thinking or talking at some stage about, you know, whether or not it makes sense now to put a solar panel on your balcony or in your backyard or something like this. Um, and of course, the EU has seized the momentum and has uh, have put forward a so-called repower EU plan that sort of aims to um, accelerate the rollout of renewable energy. Um, national governments have simplified um, processes to accelerate um, the build up um, and reduce administrative burdens. So, so this, is a, this is a lot of um, action actually in that space. Um, and you know, to get you a sense of how big the action actually is, uh, just, just look at this number. Um, if, if, we have, if we were serious about this and you know, continue to be serious about it, you know, basically we're talking here about installing 150 million solar panels and 20, uh, 12,000 wind turbines per year until, until 2030, right? So, so this, is, um, this is really huge. And you know, this, this energy transition, if we're serious about it, the climate transition means um, a lot of investments um, into renewable energy. And um, I mean, this is, <clears throat> This is not new, um, uh, but the repower EU and the energy price shock has actually accelerated um, this, um, this shift towards renewable energy. Um, the European Green Deal had been announced um, already two, three years earlier in, 20, in December 2019. It's still in the process of being finalized. I mean, there are some packages are already through the legislative processes, others not yet. 
Um, and the key here is really a mix of measures. It's a big bag of measures. Uh, the core element is uh, the widening um, and deepening of the, the emission trading system. So essentially um, getting a price signal on emissions uh, done. But there's also major regulatory measures um, and of course also public investments that will be needed, social measures and industrial policy measures. Um, the, the European Commission calls the Green Deal a growth strategy. And of course, that is highly debatable. Um, and this matters when you think about um, how to fund the investments into green. I mean, is it going to be investments that accelerate productivity growth, accelerate um, our economy's potential? Well, then you can essentially fund those investments uh, by issuing debt uh, and you know, basically fund it uh, through deficits. Um, if you think that um, it's not a growth strategy, but you know, rather uh, quite a costly strategy that doesn't increase productivity, then um, the pitch to fund um, uh, the green investments uh, through essentially through debt becomes a much more difficult pitch um, to, uh, to, uh, to pursue um, because basically the potential to pay back the debt isn't increasing with it. So, so the nature of the return on this investment is really a crucial question um, for um, uh, whether or not um, you know, uh, the, the Green Deal can or should be funded um, with um, deficits. And I'll come back to that in, in a second, but I'm looking at the time, but I think I, think I still have seven, seven minutes or so. So, so um, the, just to say the commission itself calls it a, green, a growth strategy, but their own estimates um, basically say it's not going to be a growth, growth strategy. So their own documents where they simulate this green deal don't show any positive, clear positive effects, rather neutral effects of this, uh, of this green transition. Now, quite a lot in the news in the last couple of uh, weeks and months has been um, the industrial policy dimension um, to um, the, green, the Green Deal. Um, the EU um, has put forward this Green Deal industrial plan, uh, which consists of essentially the Critical Raw Material Act, the so-called Net Zero Industry Act. They are a response to uh, the American, the US Inflation Reduction Act, but also a response to the strong dominance of China um, in um, the, um, uh, in the uh, green industry. Um, China by now dominates solar, um, the so global solar industry, and is one of the major players um, in, uh, in wind energy and invests in many, many other emerging technologies um, and does so um, not under just pure competition context, but, you know, of course, with the Chinese model with state subsidies. And so, so that's why the US has responded with this Inflation Reduction Act, which then in turn uh, triggered a lot of um, uh, responses, a lot of worry in large parts of Europe, in particular in, in France. Um, now, at the core, um, this... Um, Industrial uh, plan, industrial uh, green industry, in green industry plan has climate policy objectives. It has industrial policy objectives, and it has security objectives, right? And so this is very interesting. So you have here a plan that has actually three different types of of objectives, right? To build your industry, to make your economy greener, and to ensure that the security of supply. Um, and the dependence on China and other potentially malign actors uh, is reduced. And you know what you learn uh, and what we learn in Econ 101 is that it's always difficult when you have uh, competing and multiple policy objectives to then get your policy right. And um, you know, um, my um, I mean, I don't have time to go into detail here, but but my take is that what the EU has proposed. Um, uh, is is in in parts good, uh, but that it it really, um, to my mind, emphasizes too much um, domestic production targets, um, which will be very difficult to achieve, quite costly to achieve, uh, with relatively little gains in terms of jobs and relatively little gains in terms of um, 
actual security. And I would also argue that um, the assessment of the security risks um, uh, relating from, for example, imports of solar panels from China um, is, uh, uh, is um, much less malign than, um, or much, uh, or should at least be more precise um, than what the documents currently suggest. I mean, currently the, the documents suggest that any import above 65% of, um, of solar panels or any other of these technologies uh, from a single country um, would, would have sort of dramatic security implications. Uh, which is simply not not the case um, compared to uh, and the comparison with gas is really a wrong comparison, right? I mean, gas, if you switch off gas, the energy is gone, right? I mean, you don't have the, the energy. So you close the tap, you don't have the energy. If you don't deliver solar panels, the solar panels that we have on your roof continue to operate, right? So, so the nature of the security risk is really quite different. And uh, I don't think that there has been enough thinking on what really is the risk and what do we really need to do. My um, approach would be, um, yes, diversify supplies, but not with domestic production, but with production in other places where um, um, economic costs um, are uh, much more benign um, than, than in Europe uh, for producing some of these mass goods, which basically cannot be produced at competitive rates in Europe. Okay, so talking about the investment side, and then then I really conclude. So, so I mean, just to give you a, a broad pitch here, um, the investment needs um, are huge. Um, uh, we, we are estimating various institutions are estimating the costs to be around two percent of GDP annually um, in terms of investment into the energy and transport and housing system. So these are um, the major, uh, this is a major increase in investment. It's not all public investment. So the public, the public part to it, um, on average currently amounts to a quarter, right? A quarter of those 2% uh, would, I mean, the, the current investments in energy, infrastructure and transport is a quarter of that investment is done by the public sector on average in the EU with big differences across countries. The Netherlands has a relatively small public part. Other parties, other countries have a higher part, but let's say a quarter. So we're talking here about a half a percent uh, of uh, public investment, additional public investment on average in the EU um, for uh, funding the Green Deal. And of course, the question is how to, how to achieve that, um, that funding um, in a period of um, budget consolidations um, we know that um, historically, uh, whenever budgets um, have been consolidated, um, it tends to be done on the back of uh, public investment cuts. Um, uh, it's, so you don't consolidate your budget by cutting social spending or entitlement spending or pensions. I mean, this is very difficult. So, so what you do is you basically um, uh, tend to cut public investment. And that comes at a moment where, um, you know, we are not only just cutting, uh, we are not only just consolidating our budgets, but we also, some of us at least, uh, including Germany, uh, we actually have to increase defense spending, right? Um, uh, so, so how do you how do you get that done? How do you get that done in in our democracies, which you know find it very difficult to prioritize these kind of investments? I think this is one of the key questions. It's a question of social fairness. It's a question of distributional logic. Um, and it's a question of the future uh, future oriented investments to achieve climate goals where this current consumption. And you know, um, there, there are basically two, uh, two big options that are, are discussed. One is uh, some sort of a green golden rule where uh, your 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 public investment into the green infrastructure would be exempted from from the fiscal rules, um, and the other one is some sort of an EU uh, shifting this to the EU level, where basically it means that the borrowing doesn't happen at the national level but at the European level. But of course, the taxpayer behind it is the same taxpayer or perhaps uh, somewhat different taxpayer, but at least it's. At the EU aggregate EU level, it's the same. It's the same taxpayer. 
So both have pro and cons, um, but the reality is that um, this is actually, um, uh, this poses really significant and difficult trade-offs that politically are gonna be extremely difficult to solve uh, because, um, because of the uncertain growth effects. So if all of that green investment was generating fantastic growth rates, I wouldn't be worried, um, but this is unlikely to be the case. Um, and so, uh, so you have to uh, really face um, face budget constraints and get political prioritization right, so that uh, you know other future oriented spending, be that education, be that defense, uh, be that green, um, actually gets funded in a period of budget consolidations. So let me conclude. Uh, we had a major energy shock during twenty two. It was costly, but actually the doom, doomsday scenarios could be prevented. Um, and that's thanks to uh, basically four, four factors. Uh, we had a major expansion of gas infrastructure. We had uh, made sure that um, gas solidarity within the EU uh, was kept and gas flow flew from the West to the East. We ensured that the price signal uh, continued to be there. So savings went up, displacement of high energy intensive production happened, fuel switching happened, and there was an acceleration of the buildup of renewable infrastructure. The Green Deal and the acceleration um, of the energy transition because of the shock last year um, has major transformative effects on economy and society. Um, it changes the relation of Germany and the EU with the rest of the world. We are importing less and more quickly less from, from Russia than we ever thought we would. Um, we are importing from other players and we are importing more renewable. And that raises also a lot of questions and the response to the Chinese dominance in green technology and the US Inflation Reduction Act um, is, is a response to, to some of those worries, but it's only partially convincing. Um, lastly, for the investment, we really have to think about how we ensure the funding, uh, that funding goes into, into the necessary green um, investments um, without jeopardizing sustainability. Um, so, so my view on this is at the end of the day, um, the fiscally relatively strong countries probably will have to do it through, through deficits. Um, um, because we are not otherwise not going to be able to prioritize um, this kind of spending. While for the countries where uh, there are real fiscal constraints, in particular in the south of Europe, um, uh, you know, the trade-offs are, are real. And, you know, one has to really negotiate these trade-offs. And let me stop here. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Guntram, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Also for highlighting the huge ambitions we are facing, not only in terms of the financing needs, but also with respect to the political uh, complexities when we start deciding uh, about a golden rule at the level of national EU member states or uh, public investment funds at European level. That, that is really a tricky uh, political discussion. We know also from the discussion on next generation EU and also the Netherlands as one of the frugal countries sometimes but even at the end our Prime Minister Mark Rutte gave in after long negotiations uh, to this fund of 750 billion euros. So let me turn now to uh, um, introducing the discussant. We initially we had planned two discussants but um, unfortunately Sandra Flipper the chief economist of Avian Amro got ill today, so she really apologizes because she really had to be with her. But we have so now uh, Paul van Zeters also on the program. He is an emeritus professor at Tilburg University, and he also has been writing a lot of articles in journals and newspapers <coughs> with foreign, uh, 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 former Dutch Prime Minister Rutte Lubbers, who has been very active, as we all know, in the process of European integration. So, Paul, may I invite you to come over? We have to install your presentation, I think. It's my claim to fame, Ruud Lubbers. <laughs> That's how uh, you can end up as an uh, emeritus at Tilburg University. Ruud Lubbers was, ah, I'm already there. Can you see this control, this presentation? Yeah, okay, very good. Okay. 
No, so no small talk anymore. Uh, Dr. Wolf, thank you very much for this uh, uh, impressive, comprehensive, and uh, highly sophisticated overview of uh, the energy crisis that we are in, uh, the whole world, but uh, Europe in particular, especially after February 24 of last year. Uh, I have to apologize beforehand because I can do no justice to uh, the comprehensiveness and the sophistication of uh, your analysis, but I uh, hope I can make up for, uh, for this uh, by restricting myself to uh, three points. One, the first is uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to the way economists uh, usually and normally and commonly look at uh, unions because as you see the title of uh, my uh, reaction, uh, my talk now is an imperfect union, but look especially at the question mark behind it. Uh, my second uh, point will be uh, related to the banking uh, union. And my third and last point will be a quiz with the audience. So be prepared. <laughs> uh, first, uh, the economists, how do they look at, um, at the, uh, uh, the union, uh, the U European Union? Uh, in general, and uh, economic and monetary uh, union in uh, particular. Um, they often call it, say, uh, uh, they call it uh, a union not fit for purpose or a fragile union. The economic and monetary uh, union is not an optimal currency area like the United States or Canada. This phrase I take from uh, uh, a recent uh, uh, paper uh, published in October or November uh, 22 by the Sustainability uh, Sustainable Finance uh, Lab. Uh, they had uh, under the title, a sustainable fiscal pact for Europe. <clears throat> um, uh, Harald Benek is, of course, one of the prominent members of uh, this uh, uh, sustainable finance uh, lab. So that brought me uh, to the idea to, to, to include this in my reaction. Um, this is <clears throat> the analytical framework that is developed in, in that uh, SFL uh, uh, paper that when a union like uh, the European Union is not fit for purpose, is fragile, needs to be repaired, then you can follow two uh, scenarios, two models. One model is reinstall all the old rules and market discipline, uh, each member state on its own. This, this, I call, this I call going alone. And this is one side of a spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is a full-fledged European integration. Uh, member states share their fiscal budget. This is called full integration. This is, I think, in general, how economists approach uh, the problem of the European or the economic and monetary uh, uh, union. And to some extent, I think uh, the work of Dr. Wolf that I did read before uh, about the Green Golden Rule also fits in that analytical framework. Um, now, I object to this uh, dualistic uh, approach, one model or the other, because when what say what what economists then typically do is as I say. Uh, we need both are unrealistic. Model one or scenario one is not realistic. We can't go that way. And, and uh, the second scenario, full integration is also not realistic. So we should find something in between and go for ad hoc incidental temporary measures and just 
try uh, whatever we can think of at, at that moment. Um, and my uh, idea of the development, the historical development of the European Union is different because I think there is a third model that is very different from the two models scenarios I just uh, showed you. And uh, I call this the sui generis model. And that model also has a face and a name. And this is the face. And I, I hope you recognize the face and know its name. Well, whose name? Who are we looking at here? I think Dr. Walt will recognize this person immediately because he was working in Brussels when, what's, what's, what's the person who's now we're looking at? Who's he? Who's he? Almost, you're almost, Luc van Middelaar. Luc van Middelaar. Yeah. He was uh, uh, Van Rompuy's speech writer and advisor when uh, Dr. Wolf was working at the Bruegel Institute. So I'm quite sure he knows him very well. And Luc van Middelaar <clears throat> has developed uh, in the course of his career uh, an approach to the, to, to the historical development of the European Union, which uh, I can only uh, label uh, sui generis. It is not a member state, it is not a fully integrated uh, union, but it is a real union, which we call the European Union. And there is a real economic and monetary union, and that's how we call it. Um, I cannot, in the short time allowed me here, uh, really uh, present uh, uh, for Middelaar's uh, uh, point of view, but he has two books and particularly he has written very, very many more. But his first uh, uh, book was written in um, 2009, The Passage to Europe, The History of a Beginning. Uh, it's translated in many uh, other languages. And um, his uh, second book, particularly about Europe, is The New Politics of Europe, translated uh, in, published in 2017 and also translated in, in many uh, languages. Um, I make it uh, myself very easy. That's what I uh, often try to do by referring to the impressive uh, corpus of writings of uh, Luc van Middelaar. He writes uh, every week uh, a column in uh, NRC, one of the leading uh, Dutch newspapers. And uh, his books are uh, the best, I think, um, is the best source on what really uh, happened and is still happening uh, in, uh, in the European uh, Union. Now, on to my second point, the banking union. This, these are, we are looking now at the four pillars of the banking uh, union. And uh, <clears throat> this shows how complicated unions uh, can be because most of you will say, well, the first three, it's clear, but the fourth one, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme is still missing. But that misses some of the points because it's not missing. It's only not, not there yet. It will come there also, uh, the, the, the recent uh, uh, crises, uh, both with American banks and with European banks. And in a short while, not in a few days, but in a few months or a few years, there will be a common European deposit insurance scheme. Meanwhile, all member states of the Economic and Monetary Union have national uh, uh, deposit insurance schemes. This brings me to my, uh, and Nicolas Veron, uh, who started Bruegel in uh, the early part of this century, uh, and is still a very uh, important member of the, of the Bruegel uh, Institute. He has written uh, the most remarkable things about the banking union. In fact, he invented the, the phrase, the name banking, uh, union in articles in 2011 11 and 2012. I finish with my third and last point. 
This is my quiz. The young woman uh, on the left upper side of the screen, do we recognize her? We do, all of us recognize. What's her name? Huh? Greta, yeah, very good. Greta Thunberg. And who is the person, the woman on the right upper side? Who's that? I, I, I hear it mumbling. Speak up, speak up. Who's she? Yes. Marianne Mesma. And who is the woman at the bottom? Say that again. Yeah, I, I, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Mar Marianne Minesma, who's the who's the the woman at the bottom? Anyone here? She's Gail Bradbrook. And why is she world famous? Because she started in 2018 Extinction Rebellion. And Marianne Minesma is world famous because uh, 15 years ago she started Urgenda. And Greta Thunberg is world famous because in 2018 she started Fridays for Future, the school strike. This is my last, this is my message. This is my message. We should look at social organizations, bottom up organized in societies, and they will take care of the European values, make sure that society in general, the politicians, uh, the European Parliament will be convinced that something needs to be done there, and that's the way forward in uh, the role of European values and, uh, and the green transition we all need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I see it's almost 4.45. I know you have to leave us for the urgent appointment, Guntram, very soon. But perhaps a brief response to one or two, one, one or two points with respect to the discussions. Uh, look, thank you so much. This was was a great, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I like Luc Vermidela's work a lot, I have to say. So, um, so yes, I'm, I'm actually quite sympathetic to this really generous um, um, idea. Um, but I do want to point out that um, while sui generis works, um, uh, it, it's not um, always the optimal uh, way of doing it. Um, and um, it is a reflection of the complexity of Europe and therefore it's fully justified. Um, but it does mean that on some issues um, uh, we are working less effectively um, than we, we we would want to work um, with consequences for um, you know our welfare and our European way of life compared to our uh, competitors that are not sleeping at all uh, on the contrary so so I think that's that's the core the core issue but but I do agree that it's probably in terms of what we can achieve the only thing we can do. And I, unfortunately, I have to leave now, but thank you so much for the great present, uh, great uh, comments. And I really enjoyed uh, giving a presentation today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you very much.